Uh, so my name is Moises Echeverria, and I have the, the pleasure to serve as the president and CEO of the Oklahoma Center for Community and Justice. And I'm Gary Palouse-Overden. I am president emeritus at Phillips Theological Seminary and currently the executive director of the Center for Religion and Public Life. Um, we're really pleased to welcome you to our, our first of this type of the One for Many services. Um, uh, one for Many is what we call this. Uh, it is a service for those who are looking to participate in shaping a more just, inclusive, and compassionate nation. Um, the original model, as you may know, uh, was, a, was never the official model, but the original model of the United States was e pluribus unum, um, uh, out of many, one, or one for many, as we've translated it. It's still an unfulfilled aspiration of this nation. Uh, uh, equality still eludes us, uh, and a sense of being one people is, is something we're constantly building. It's been an elusive uh, aspiration, but it's still a good aspiration. Uh, and sure. we've this the theme of what we're trying to do together. For sure. And uh, I just wanted to also mention that this service is being co-sponsored and produced by the Center for Religion in Public Life at Phillips Theological Seminary and the Oklahoma Center for Community and Justice. Um, we're gonna start, uh, after having done these introductions, we're, we're going to start first thing uh, uh, is a song uh, performed by a local artist, Cassie Steffen. Um, uh, the song is called Trapeze Artist. Now I want you to get that image of a trapeze artist in mind. Uh, put that in mind, accompanied by the experiences that if you were a trapeze artist, you might feel of uh, the hope for grace out of what comes out of this, but also the risk, the fear, and the hope. Let's listen to the song. My heart is like a trapeze artist Balancing it all Between the painful cries The fearful lies And the promise of a gentle sigh One day you see the good that could be Done by us all And then the next you see The tyranny of hate that keeps Building up our walls so I'll keep hoping for tomorrow If tomorrow exists at all I'll keep hoping for love Oh, this love has let me fall I keep hoping that maybe These times will finally change But with all this hoping I wonder if it's still worth it To hope at all and ooh, 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 so please tell me this gets easier not seeing beyond the curve to a future that might hold my promise or a destiny that burns because there's arms that hit and there's hands that hold and there's hearts that judge and there's eyes with soul and we're all just lost in a forest of our own and i'll keep hoping for tomorrow if tomorrow exists at all i keep hoping for love oh this love has let me fall i keep hoping that maybe this time's will finally change but with all this hope it's still worth it to hope at all.
So I keep hoping for tomorrow If tomorrow exists at all I keep hoping for love Oh, this love has let me fall I keep hoping that maybe This times will finally change But with all this hoping I wonder if it's still worth it To hope at all So here, here comes, here comes the light. Here, here comes, here comes the light. Here. Thank you. Uh, Moises, what did you think of, what did you think, what did you feel as you were listening to Cassie sing that? You know, uh, for me, that song uh, has so much meaning. I think all of us have been in situations when we wonder if it's worth to keep hope. Um, and when I feel that way, I turn to those who I know love me and inspire me. And while right now there's so many things that cause us to feel trouble, to, uh, to perhaps have fear, um, there's also so many things and so many people that are worth keeping hope for. Yeah. Yeah. I, I just, I, you would never find me in a, on a trapeze. Um, uh, but the whole, you know, the experience she presents there of, there's the hope that the other person on the other end is going to catch you. There's the fear that they might not. And you end with the fear or end with the hope. Um, I thought her song just did a great job of swinging back and forth um, uh, between those two poles, which is, I feel, uh, uh, pretty close to where I think we're at as a, as a people, as a nation right now. We're swinging back and forth between fear uh -huh. and hope. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, Gary, I would like to introduce our, our next, um, our first speaker, which is a dynamic and fantastic, impressive young man. His name is Parrish Pipestem. He's a senior at Booker T. Washington here in Tulsa. And he also serves on the OCCJ Board of Directors as a student representative. Um, and he is gonna share with us his hope uh, regarding sovereign nations. Very good, so, thanks. Hi, my name is Parrish Pipestem, and one hope that I have for this nation as an indigenous person is for tribal sovereignty to be upheld and respected. My grandfather used to say that tribal sovereignty gives our people hope for survival. 
Tribal sovereignty allows us to have jurisdiction over our people as well as preserve our cultural identity. I hope this is always honored, recognized, and respected for years to come. Thank you. I also find it really fascinating being an immigrant um, to this country and, and having lived in Oklahoma now for 22 years and learning about the, the uh, tribal nations within Oklahoma, I am always surprised at how little um, Oklahomans understand about sovereign nations. And so um, I just love um, uh, Parrish's words and, and the hope that he conveys um, of, of his grandfather uh, in, in regards to uh, preserving culture and, and, um, and maintaining traditions that, that's so important. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it was a pleasure to listen to him. All right, so our next speaker is Jesse Ulrich. Um, I first got to know Jesse when he was uh, worked with me on uh, OCCJ's trial log committee. Um, uh, he is the founder of a podcast called Pod for Good. Uh, and he and his company uh, love telling stories and, uh, and love helping businesses for profit and nonprofit. Um, uh, uh, tell their stories. Uh, and he's done a great job with that. Um, I think he's, they've assembled, he and his partner Chris have assembled over uh, nearly 30 podcasts now with a variety of Tulsans, all doing really important community building work. Um, I think you've been on, and I know uh, I have, uh, and uh, Chris and Jesse are just uh, uh, great to sit down and, and, and uh, 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 correspond with. So, uh, uh, here's Jesse Ulrich. Hello, my name is Jesse Ulrich. I'm the CEO of Rant9 Productions, a podcast production company that helps nonprofits by helping them tell their stories. The hope I have for the nation is there's both a short-term one and a long-term one. A short-term one is that we all get through this pandemic as quickly as possible. My long-term one is that societal issues that were easy to ignore or hide before the pandemic are given the attention they deserve once it's over. Things I'm con continually moved by, I'm gonna cheat and use something from my background as a Jewish historian, and that is George Washington's letter to a Jewish congregation in Rhode Island after he was elected our first president of the United States. And it was really the first time in the modern age that a leader of a country promised to a group of Jews that they were going to live in a place that was not only tolerant, but granted li liberty of, of conscience for all, regardless of their background or religious beliefs. Thank you. Um, I really appreciated hearing from Jesse, and especially that letter um, in, in the theme of the letter that, that he shared from um, Washington to, to the Jewish congregation. I, I, I forget how uh, pluralistic this this nation has been since its founding, and and so it was a nice reminder for all of us that uh, that whenever uh, different congregations or different or people from different uh, traditions can can worship in peace, that all of us benefit uh, from from ensuring that everyone can can um, practice their beliefs. Um, in a way that, that promotes um, respect for others. Uh, next, I would like to introduce our next um, speaker, Hannah Moore, um, who I got a chance to, uh, to meet through OCCJ's Interfaith Youth Programs. Uh, she is a Tolson um, and she's entering her senior year at Ohio State University. And can you think about how, how tough it is to be um, a student uh, during this time? So um, Hannah Moore uh, shares um, how her hope for, for us to be the best versions of ourselves. Yep. I hope for this nation that there is a day when the system uplifts people who are oppressed instead of being inherently racist. I hope for this nation that one day people are able to be the best versions of themselves without having to hide it from society. I hope one day that this nation will give quality education to everyone, not just those who are fortunate. I hope for this nation that one day 
Differences will unite us instead of divide us. I, all, I second what you had to say about how difficult it would be to be a college student, especially a college senior. Yeah. This is not the way anybody would want their, their senior year uh, to start out. Um, I too really appreciated uh, what she had to say in terms of um, being the best versions of ourselves uh, rather than having to fit into someone else's mold uh, uh, so that that sense of liberty and, free and freedom, but the mutuality of that meaning, and we recognize that's for everybody else too. Um, our next speaker is uh, somebody I've known for quite a long time now, uh, seminary president, Nancy Claire Pittman, who's been with Phillips since uh, 2005 in three different roles. Uh, she currently serves and for the last couple of years as president. Um, for a number of years, uh, Nancy, uh, uh, hosted uh, faculty Christmas parties uh, over at our house during the Advent season. We all got to see um, this expansive, extensive uh, uh, miniature village that she sets up uh, over a, a, a large part of the living space in her house. Um, and she does a, a wonderful job of reflecting on that as uh, sort of a spiritual discipline. Uh, so let's listen to what she has to say about the discipline of setting up hope one house at a time. Years ago, in the late 70s or early 80s, my mother began to buy miniature houses and trees and persons and shops and churches in a collection called Snow Village. At first, she bought them only to put up at Christmas, but as the collection grew, she kept it up all year long. I think she was doing it out of sort of a nostalgia for that time right after World War II when middle-class white people began to experience some prosperity in the United States and had in their mind a particular kind of community that to them was the ideal. When she died, my sisters and I broke up this collection of houses and began individually to add to them. I have far outstripped my sisters now, and my collection is huge. At first, I kept doing this collection because it was somehow a way to connect nostalgically with my mother. As the years have passed, I've realized I'm not doing it, though, out of a nostalgia for a past that never really existed. I'm doing it out of a sense of hope. I only put up the collection for Advent and Christmas. It takes at least a month for me to get all my stuff out. And it takes about a month to put away after Christmas. For you see, I only want it up during that particular time of the year because I now realize that this Snow Village collection has become for me a kind of spiritual practice in hope. Every late October, November, and December, I'm building a world that I'm hoping for. Here's what I hope. I hope that in the United States, we become a place where all people can live well and comfortably with their neighbors. I hope we become a place in which everyone can choose the dwelling in which they want to live as family and that they can choose the kind of family that they want to be. I hope that on all our street corners, we have a variety of places of worship in which each person can choose to express the holy justice and love as they see fit with one another. 
Now I know my collection still looks like a white middle-class suburban area, although I assiduously look now for figurines of all colors and for buildings like synagogues and mosques and temples so that my collection will be an expression of my hope for America, that we become a place where people thrive, where people pursue meaning and purpose and goodness in the ways that they see fit. I, I really appreciate Nancy's words. I am so delighted that, that she is in her role at Phillips and following your, your um, um, big shoes that you left there, uh, Gary. I, I really felt that, that she spoke, her hope um, is that of freedom and liberty uh, for people to be able to choose where to live, um, how to worship, um, and to be, to be guaranteed safety. Um, and, and not safety because there's uh, militarization necessarily uh, of law enforcement and swift justice, but safety because everyone has become to understand the need to, for, for people to express those freedoms um, in a way, again, in a way that, that respects the freedoms of others. So I, I was really moved by her words and really Absolutely. appreciate her. Go ahead and introduce Phil. Yes, so Phil Armstrong, um, who is a fantastic uh, leader in the community and we're so um, fortunate to have him. He is a project director for the 1921 Tulsa Race Massacre Centennial Commission. And among his many, many talents, he has a wonderful singing voice. Yes. So he starts his remarks with a song. I don't feel no waste tired. I've come too far from where I started from. Nobody told me the road would be easy, but I don't believe he's brought me this far to leave me. These words are very well known in the African American church experience and in the United States and around the world. I don't feel no ways tired seems to be an appropriate um, thought provoking song when we think of where we are when it comes to race relations and where people of great moral conviction stand on the side of history in 2020. My name is Phil Armstrong and I'm the project director for the 1921 Tulsa Race Massacre Centennial Commission. And as we prepare for 2021, and as a city, as a state, as a nation, and realistically the world, looks in on Tulsa, Oklahoma 100 years later after this terrible massacre that took place, what will we as citizens of the world be able to say is better or has progressed since 1921. As we plan to build a world-class history center called Greenwood Rising, the history of Black Wall Street uh, that will debut in 2021. And as many groups around this city come together to plan and commemorate this time, it's interesting to see here in 2020, almost a spiritual passing of the baton from those who were the champions, the generals of the civil rights movements and many of the blessings that you and I had the advantage and had the opportunity to take advantage of, um, that they are passing away, that they are transitioning from this life to the next. 
just in 2020, when you think about Charles Evers, uh, the brother of Medgar Evers, and his death uh, not too far from the time that I'm sitting and recording this video, to um, C.T. Vivian on the same day that uh, John Lewis also transitioned. Uh, both having worked alongside Martin Luther King Jr. in the progress for um, nonviolent approach to civil rights, uh, even to Fred Davis, who also transitioned this year um, and was a pivotal leader in the Memphis uh, civil rights movements. All of these individuals taking their leave at this time, I can't help but wonder if there is a spiritual passing of the baton. And so the question remains, or the question is, who among us are going to grab the baton and carry it forward? And so this history that we are in, this timeline that we are in, this period that we're in, we must stand together. We must look forward to the future. We must look at the opportunities we have in spite of the racial deep divide and divisions in many parts of this country that we see in 2020, as if history is repeating itself. We must stand with these words in our hearts and in our minds on the shoulders of those who have fought, literally bled, and literally died so we can be here and say that we are no ways tired, that we will take the baton for freedom, for racial healing, for racial reconciliation. And we will use this year and 2021, not as an ending point, but as a launching pad to carry us into the future so that people all over the world can come here to this time period and say in 2020, in 2021, something happened to the moral compass of this nation Something happened to the moral traje uh, trajectory of this country and of this world that citizens stood together and said enough is enough. Um, and that we come together to coalesce and to make sure that our voices are louder than the minute and minor voices of division and dissension among us. Proverbs, the 29th chapter, 11th verse says, fools give full vent to their rage but the wise bring calm in the end. Let's stand together in the end and show this world and show those that will come behind us that we picked up the baton, that we passed it forward to the next generation for racial reconciliation, unity, and healing in this state, in this nation, in this world. God bless. I'll tell you, um, I was, uh, uh, I was a, a, a track runner uh, in uh, high school um, and I participated in, in a number of relay races. Um, and I know oftentimes uh, a race is won or lost in those baton exchanges. Uh, so I really resonated with that image of uh, the batons being passed uh, and uh, who is on the receiving end uh, and, uh, and prepared to run this race. So I, I really appreciated those words. All right, now we'd like to hear from um, Amber Howard Cornelius. Uh, she's a Tulsa attorney and has been a long-serving now board member for OCCJ. Um, and she's going to read to us some words that are new to all of us uh, in the last uh, couple of months because they were written as sort of a last public uh, communication from uh, Representative John Lewis uh, uh, in the week before his passing. It was published right after his death. So let's hear Amber read from those words. Hi, my name is Amber Howard Cornelius and I'm a member of the Oklahoma Center for Community and Justice Executive Committee. Today, I'm going to share a reading with you that gives me hope for America. It's an excerpt from an essay written by the late Congressman and civil rights leader, John Lewis. He wrote this piece shortly before his death and it was published in the New York Times upon his passing. It says, 
Ordinary people with extraordinary vision can redeem the soul of America by getting into what I call good trouble, necessary trouble. Voting and participating in the democratic process are key. The vote is the most powerful nonviolent change agent you have in a democratic society. You must use it because it is not guaranteed. You can lose it. Though I may not be here with you, I urge you to answer the highest calling of your heart and stand up for what you truly believe. In my life, I have done all I can to demonstrate that the way of peace, the way of love and nonviolence, is the more excellent way. Now, it is your turn to let freedom ring. Thank you. Right. Um, I, I really appreciate um, Ember's uh, choosing to read from the late representative John Lewis's um, letter that he wrote all of us. Uh, I remember uh, his passing and, and reading um, the, the, whole, the whole letter um, as it was published um, in the New York Times. And I was so, so moved. Um, his life truly was the example that, that we should follow in, in promoting um, uh, respect, in promoting changes, in promoting justice, and in being the leaders, in, in, in taking on um, uh, those responsibilities to, to lead and to advocate from within and from without. Um, everything that it takes, and so I am just so grateful for his example, for his for his legacy and his life um, in in fighting for social justice and civil rights. We're nearing the end, and this is the last song for for uh, this program. is called the city, and so as you um, as as she begins, she tells us the story behind the song, um, and and explaining this city uh, a place that, that, we long, that we long for to, to be including. So uh, I'm excited to listen to her. Yeah. yeah. What do you do when faces that you never knew become names that become your friends? In a place where a okay is more than just a simple phrase, it's a way to say it's who I am. If you're me, you'll just deny, you'll fight, and then you'll cry as this place becomes a home you never knew you needed with its wide open place and faces that I can't forget somehow they know my name and they want me to stay and sit in the bar downtown where the music gets loud I never thought I'd be in the city gets me gather round while Guthrie plays his two chords and Dylan wants to join him in a song and in this place you're two degrees from everyone and your neighbor is the family across the way and we're working to reconcile that we're all one human race with a lot of different sides with its Faces that you can't forget 
where the music gets loud You never thought you'd be in this city But thank God somehow It's got wide open place The faces that I can't forget Somehow they know my name And they want me to stay The music it's loud You never thought you'd be in the city But thank God somehow Somehow It gets me I really uh, appreciate uh, uh, and uh, also long for, you know, that place where you feel like, you know, the people there get me. Um, uh, I, one fits in, one belongs, uh, and and I think one of the one of the most profound struggles going on in our society today is around who belongs. Uh, what does it mean to belong? Uh, who determines who belongs in the life? So uh, uh, it's great that she found Tulsa to be a place that gets her where she feels like she belongs. And I mean, that would be a wish I would have for everybody in this country. Well, as we close out, let's, uh, let's go ahead and reflect briefly too. For, for you, Moises, what is, what is the hope you have for this nation? You know, in this in these troubles of times, um, I feel like sometimes it's easy to lose hope. Um, however, my hope is that as awareness of injustices continue to increase and we learn more about the systemic nature of oppression and how so many individuals throughout time have had to endure um, injustices and ridicules and, and uh, violence and um, so on and so forth that all of us we feel um, like we that that is up to us that we will feel empowered to advocate for justice and for truth um, and that collectively we will inspire each other um, and collectively we will change systems and, and, and so I hope for this, for this place, this, this world where, where we um, value each other's humanity first and foremost and, and inspire and elevate each other. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I guess for me, it would be uh, that hope that, uh, on, especially on the other side of this pandemic, uh, that th those who have been saying uh, let's not return to normal. Um, let's deal with some of the issues that we haven't been dealing with uh, to make a new normal, which is better than the old normal, uh, where uh, the value of equality is valued in the United States as much as the values of liberty and freedom. Uh, and we find ways to uh, reorganize ourselves accordingly uh, to um, include um, uh, as 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 broad a swath of, of, of viewpoints as we possibly can, uh, and that no one be rejected for who they were born as, who they who they believe they themselves are. I mean, to go back to what Anna said, a place where we can all be our best selves. I think would be a fabulous country 